Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the crossover with Joe R. Lucas. We've just started our fifth season of Man, and we off to a great one. And today, without a doubt, is another spectacular interview. If I introduced my next guest by name and all of his accomplishments, we wouldn't have any time for the actual podcast itself. So let me narrow it down. The man wins no matter where he goes. If his name wasn't so Italian, most people would probably think he was Spanish. And I have a feeling you know what I'm talking about. It's the coach of Virtus Bologna, Sergio Scariolo. Coach, how are you, my man? Pretty good. Pretty good, Joe. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Like I was telling you earlier before we started, I got to see all the veterans last night and all the, you know, all of us, all of us old graying guys, you know, at the, the Real Madrid veterans <laughs> dinner. It's always nice to catch up. I was watching up. into that picture. I was watching <laughs> into that picture. I said, hey, I coached this guy. I coached this guy. But it doesn't yeah. look like it. Am I looking that, that older? <laughs> No, no, no. You, you, the, the problem with you is you're looking younger all the time. That's what makes me upset. When I saw yeah, your age, I'm like, you. man, he's older than me. Hey, first of all, thank obviously, you. I wanted, I want to thank you for taking the time out of of such a busy schedule with Euro League, the Italian League, and obviously family obligations during the holiday season. But I read somewhere, um, I don't know where it was. I have no idea because I'm always researching different things. And I read somewhere like your schedule one week where it was like a double week. Then you had the Italian domestic league games, but you also had the Spanish national team duties. And it was like, there was, I said, when does this guy eat or breathe? <laughs> but how, how busy is your actual schedule juggling so many different things? Well, it's a matter of organization, Ma matter of uh, having clear what is urgent. Uh, what is important, where you have to put your priorities on. Um, actually, that week was quite, quite tricky because uh, I was, uh, I was having practice with the uh, Virtus in the morning with the national team in the afternoon. I just keep one press practice in the whole week with the national team before the day before the game when we flew to, well, actually when we, when we drove to Milan. And then when I got back, I rejoined the national team. And actually, listen, there were two wins, two big wins <laughs> against Milan and, and Italy. So I'm uh, looking forward to repeat it. If, if the outcome is going to be the same, I can go also triple turn <laughs> if you find me any, any junior or cadet team to, to practice in the meantime, in the lunchtime. So I, I take care of my shape as well. What... what uh, I mean, I'm going to get into it a little bit later, obviously, but my my biggest question with the national team is how the hell did you guys win this summer? How, how did you win Eurobasket? I, I, I got to think with all the accomplishments that we'll talk about throughout the interview, because we'll get started with your life in general, but this has to be one of the biggest coaching accompli accomplishments of your career, wasn't it? I mean, because you weren't expected to win. You guys were losing games by 20. Every time I turn around, you're losing by 20. And, and I don't know, was it, was it your coaching? Was it a belief of your team? Or was it maybe a disbelief of the other teams that said, oh, we're not supposed to beat Spain this easily? And they ended up, I, I don't know. I don't know where, or was this a combination of everything? Well, uh, yeah, probably a combination of everything. I think that, um, first of all, from the pure basketball point of view in terms of, uh, in term of uh, O's and X's, probably this year there was, there was the biggest gap between expectations and, and the final result. That's true. So if you want to put it that way, you might define it, right? Like, like uh, quite usual. But honestly, from a coach standpoint, as you know, coaching is about, uh, uh, you know, team leadership, uh, uh, roles, uh, motivation, personalities, chemistry, and uh, from this specific plus, of course, the the, the was an exit, the strategies, game plans, and practice, and and, uh, and whatever. Oh, from from the specific, uh, let's say, from a specific coach, head coach standpoint, I found it uh, way more difficult to to find a way to make it work. Previously, when we had so many great uh, superstars and personalities, yeah. then this time. This time was, of course, 
much more difficult from the from the O's and X's point of view. But uh, um, it was it was a right in the park in terms of uh, handling people, in terms of making them uh, really commit from day one, not having any any kind of uh, of uh, jealousy, any kind of uh, concern about their own role. Uh, they were all out from, from from minute one. Whoever was even calling someone who was who had been cut before, he was joining the team with a high level of motivation and high energy. So from that specific uh, standpoint, it was it was I would say I would say even quite easy, honestly. Uh, but I mean, I had to be one of your proudest moments, obviously. But I mean, yeah. it was. It was it was incredible because I mean everybody expects you to win with Pau and with, you know with Mark and with Juan Carlos and you know Philippe and everybody else, but this year was was yeah. totally different. But let, let let let's get into what the crossover is all about now, and then we'll get to that part again more. But it's about it's about you and your your life. Your dad was a big influence, from what I understand, uh, from early on. You're born in Brescia, and and. Was he a basketball player, or did he just he was a teacher? But did he he pushed you towards basketball? He was a teacher, and his class was the first one I I saw play in a in a you know academic high school competition. Back mm -hmm. then, it was his first year uh, teaching. He was still in high school. Then he moved to, to university. And uh, that those were the first game basketball games I ever saw. Then it was uh, basically pushing me to to do sport. He never he was not a player. He was he was liking uh, sport. He was um, a row a row guy. He won right. twice Italian championship back in back in the ages in uh, eight people row. I don't know what's the right the right definition of that. Uh, the, the rowing, the the, row, the rowing, uh, yeah, the rowing yeah. with the, with eight eight rowers uh, in a in a row actually. So um, and they wanted me from from day one to do sport. I, I swam. I was playing soccer. I was playing damn basketball. At the same time, I was skiing. I was, you know, he was big big sport fan, but never never pushed me towards any any discipline in terms of uh, uh, this is what I like you. You try to, and I try to do the same with my with my kids as well. I think it's the best way to make them a uh, sports fan, not necessarily a sport professional. Maybe one or the two will become uh, a sport sport play, basketball player. But uh, in general, I think this is the right attitude you got to have as a parent. Yeah, exactly. We, the, it, I, I laugh because it's uh, one of your coaches as you were growing up was Ricardo Sales, and yeah. I say, and I read that uh, he. He recognized that you were a fast learner and offered you your first coaching job at 22 years old. Now, my question is, did he see the lack of talent in you as a basketball player? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, you, you didn't need this super uh, brilliant basketball mind to recognize that. <laughs> everybody everybody would, would, would recognize that. I mean, I was... I was uh, Having great fun and and I, you know, climb until until getting close to the to the main team, the, the professional team in my city. But uh, then I got uh, I got an injury back then. Um, of course, basketball didn't lose anything, losing me as a player the, quite early at all. The, the, and on top of it, you went and got a law degree also. You went to, to study law. The, yeah, was that, that was my my family was an academic family. I mean, both right. both my parents were teachers. And there was a, a university teacher, my mom, a high school teacher. So there was a no brainer. I mean, whatever I decided, I would decide to do after the degree. It was was completely. I was completely. I was going to be completely free to 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 choose it, but uh, finish university and get. Uh, the law degree, which I actually chose after high school, was uh, let's say um, the, the the minimum required to, to have a, a lunch, a dinner, a bed. Uh, <laughs> at home. Otherwise, there was there was probably there, I would have been in trouble, deep trouble. 
So I mean, with with parents that are that are educators and teachers, that's pretty much uh, that's expected of you, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when when did you when did you decide? Okay, this is this is I have a law degree. I mean, obviously, a law degree is one of the best degrees you could have. You know, as far as if you want to go out and practice and open up your own own you know business or whatever. But when did you decide to go? Basketball is the way I really want to go because. I mean, you're ta- you're literally taking a risk there because a law degree is a little bit, a little bit more guaranteed, so to speak, of a of a future and a career than than coaching at 22, 23 years old. Definitely, but uh, my decision was quite early, right after my first first year in college, and I was started basically I started to coach kids and then making having fun and, and making a good thing and then ricardo sales picked me up for uh, as one of his uh, assistant coaches at back then there were two assistant coach one of those were were basically the the real assistant coach and the other one was uh, passing the ball was a ball a little bit more than a ball boy so okay. that was me back then but but uh, but the feeling that that could be my my way in my my road into into uh, my future life was was there very early. So actually, I finished my last my last university year was like uh, uh, you know when you are winning by twenty and you are just letting the the, <laughs> the, the clock go. Like, let's move on. Let's hurry up. I had already I had already decided to to do. Back then there was a mandatory military service in Italy. So right. you had you had to do it, but this this my this Ricardo Sales, my my historic uh, say head coach, uh, had found me uh, a job as a head coach in a second division team, which was basically composed only for people who were serving their mandatory military service here. So we were close to Rome. We were all all together in a place like in a, in a sports center. It was a great way, by the way, to do to, to do my my youth as a as a as a citizen, and then after that, I signed for Scavolini Pesaro uh, right right after. I, I I didn't even had finished my my military service, signed as a assistant coach and head of uh, of the youth uh, program. But with with the military team, you won a championship. That was actually your first championship, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a world <laughs> championship. Yeah, it was. <laughs> well, Wait, explain, you had to go. Ex- explain to me, uh, you're in the Italian military, and how do you win a world championship? Well, because they were organizing a world championship between uh, national teams made of military people, really? which were nobody was a, was a real soldier. I mean, everybody were players or coaches, but. Back then, in Europe at least, most of the countries were asking to, to serve during one year uh, in, the, in, the, in this, this different kind of, of army can be, can be, you know, the, the, the fly army, can be navy, can be, can be the army, can be the police or whatever. And you had to do it. There, were, there was no, right. no shortcut. And my family, if, even if it, there was a shortcut, the family would never, ever and <laughs> get a shortcut. You go, you run your stuff, and then you learn how to live outside your your house. And uh, actually, it was fun. And we were competing every every weekend. We were playing against regular teams who who were playing in the uh, let's say third official championship. There was A1, A2, and B1, and we were in the, in the, in the B1 plus two times during the year. We were regrouping with uh, uh, all the all the players who were uh, actually playing with their own team, but at the same time doing the military service. They were coming and we're competing against U.S., against France, against Holland, Germany, and and so on. That's great. It's crazy. You don't ever yeah. even hear of these things. And and I mean, when I started doing your thing, I'm like, he's got championships. He's got titles I've never even heard of like that one. You know what? Because you're American. Because. <laughs> you, you didn't have that mandatory, but the, the right, fun exactly. thing about American American teams is that uh, for whatever reason nobody could be above six six. 
because probably in the army or whatever you couldn't right you couldn't, right of course yeah so so it was was nice because you had all the piece of all in post up <laughs> seal them they're small <laughs> find a way to, actually that they were they were struggling and competing but they were way smaller than the european teams right you you had uh, success in Pesaro and 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 everybody. And my my biggest question here is, how I don't know how much English you spoke back then in in the in the in the eighties and nineties or how much Spanish because I know you learned Spanish when you came to Basconia from what I from what I researched. How does a guy like Alexander Alexander Nikolic become like a mentor of yours? How does it? How how does I mean, obviously, everybody knew who he was that was growing up at that time, and and people that were coaching. But how do how does he become a mentor that you've actually confided in and talked with? Actually, this is a fun story because it uh, involves you a little bit. Involves me. In, yeah, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. We, I was coaching forty two to the other the other Bologna team, right? And uh, uh, I had a very Curious, let's say, very, very funny owner, Mr. Serragnoli. Uh, and uh, every every day he was coming out with a, with a new idea. He wanted, wanted to do something. I don't even tell you most of this idea because we, we better we better um, keep it keep it keep it quiet. But uh, one day he came up with, uh, uh, for example, you had. Just scored 45 points against Virtus in a in a Euro Cup, Euro League, Euro League champion. No, no, coach, 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 come on, give me some credit, man. It was 63. Oh, 63 yeah. against Virtus. Yeah, well, 63. No, <laughs> I, I, I went short. I went short. So the next day he came out and said, "Listen, somebody who scored 63 on Virtus, we got to hire him right away. So let's send a, a, a fly. Let's send a plane there." To pick him up, a private flight. Listen, the guy's playing Real Madrid, man. <laughs> Slow down, relax. I mean, it's not, not, not going to leave Real Madrid to come play for Virgil Co- next day. Co- coach, one of the- coach, hey, coach, my bags were packed. <laughs> you, re- you, you, you realize that the funny thing about that story is I was, because part of my question was if you were the, if you were coaching then uh, the other Bologna team. And because t- you know Piero Costa. Yeah, of course, of course. But Piero calls me before the game, before the game against against Virtus. Uh-huh. And he says, hey, because Piero was my general manager in Caserta. Right. And he says, uh, and he became an agent. So I said, I said, Piero, what's up? He says, uh, he says, we have an offer from you from uh, 42 to Bologna, the other team. I said, look, I said, I'm in one of the most important games of the season. We're playing for first place tomorrow. I said, don't, I said, don't call my agent. Don't talk to me. And he's like, no, no. He's like, you have to hear this offer. And he gave me this crazy, crazy offer. <laughs> You're much more than I was making in Madrid. And I said, uh, I said, I said, look. I said, call me tomorrow, will you? I said, call me tomorrow. I went out. I scored 63. <laughs> he called me the next day. I said, I said, remember your offer? He said, yeah. I said, double it. And he said, and now I know what you're talking about, your president. And I, he's, I said, double it. He, and the coach says. Or Piero called me back. He said, I talked to the president and they'll double it. And they flew my wife at the time in a private jet to Bologna to pick out a school, apartments, and everything. Yeah. It was a crazy time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember they came up and, and uh, next morning and say, Are you are you okay with it? Of course I am okay, but I I'm not sure that the guy would like to leave Real Madrid to come over. And but then I don't know what happened. Anyway, this one was one of his original idea. And yeah, another one was, hey, do you think that uh, uh, we might strengthen our coaching staff with uh, more assistant coaches or blah, blah, blah? I said, listen, if you want to do a smart thing, bring over two, three times during the season coach Aja Nikolic, who, mm-hmm. uh, whom I consider it, and I still consider probably the, the most brilliant uh, basketball mind back then uh, or through the ages. And have him stay with me during one week, two, three times per week. So observe, uh, you know, talk to me before practice, after practice. But did you know him at the time? Did you have a relationship at no, the time? Or no, zero, 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 zero relationship. <laughs> Not at all. And he said, good idea. And the next day, actually, 
somebody gave me the number of Professor Nicholas and said, call him over. Uh, and, 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 uh, and honestly, it was one of the biggest uh, learning steps I could ever make because it was really, really an unbelievable learning experience. He came, I think, three times throughout the season. He was there watching. Sometimes he wanted also to step in on the floor and, 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 and teach something to the player. Of course, I was like, oh, uh, prof, go in and do whatever you, you, feel, you feel you want to do. I was unbelievable, like unbelievable experience. And he was, and we kept in touch for many, many years later. We were calling, I said, I was calling and it was like, Molly. And, uh, and, and I was you know, like, hey, he's, he's ready to talk. Otherwise, he wouldn't even pick up. But it was great. It was great. He, he, he's, it's amazing how many people he's touched and influenced, you know, through, through just, like you say, just, like little comments, little words, little suggestions or whatever. I never met him. I never had the opportunity to meet him. But right. uh, there's nobody that talks badly about him, you know, right. and, and it's absolutely amazing. So from here, you, you Italy, obviously successful. And what makes, other than an offer from Basconia to move to Spain, what makes you want to, were you looking to change, to, to grow a little bit? Because at that time, basketball was I mean, you know, I, when I played in Caserta, uh, you know, it was that was when Italian basketball was was God in 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 Europe. You had all the best American players, you know, El Messengero, El Messengero, uh, Roma, everybody, and it was the best basketball around. But that kind of went away a little bit. Was it a move to further your career to go get an international taste, go be in another country? What was yeah. the, what was the reason? The reason why to, to broaden my, my market, basically, because I thought that uh, Italian basketball was uh, slowly decreasing its, uh, I would say, value, power, or efficiency, or whatever you want to call it. And I was feeling that Spanish basketball was on its way up. Mm -hmm. Actually, my last year in Fortitude, I went to school here in Bologna. I went to school during one year, I mean, to private school, to the Berlitz private school, learning, learning Spanish. And during... That summer, I met uh, uh, in, the, in the Portsmouth Invitational. Um, Portsmouth, uh, Portsmouth. <laughs> yeah, my yeah. favorite place. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Um, Alfredo Salazar, who was, say, the, the right. yeah, general manager, whatever. I mean, Alfredo is always in a, in a, in a, is, is the, the chief of basketball operation, I would say. In but, Basconia. He, but, he does, he, but he does everything in that club. I mean, he yeah. does, uh, and his recruiting skills are incredible. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But look at, look at the team they built up, they built yeah. up this year. So, yeah. um, and, and uh, we had, a, you know, you, you conversations, we got along. And when uh, actually uh, it happened that uh, Manel Comas signed for Barcelona, deep into the postseason, mm -hmm. uh, they called me and they asked me if I wanted to, to, to join them. And that was a great decision on my side because it was opening the, you know, the, the, the international basketball for me and probably no better place to make your first step outside your country than in Spain and mm -hmm. uh, specifically in Vitoria where there were with a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of desire to to climb to the next to the next level. It, it, it's an incredible place to, to be able to live and, and play or, or coach because the because you have so much support from well you have support when you win. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, it's true. That's true. Not, not so much support when you lose. But it, it, speaking about, I don't know how it is for coaches, and and I know what it's like for me as a player. Like some of the some of the the best memories I have are the, or the the most memories I have I guess are the worst ones you know when you lost that that championship game or you lost that the playoff series or whatever you took Basconi to the finals I can imagine what the excitement was and unbelievably you lose to TDK Mandresa <laughs> which yeah, is yeah it was it was a nightmare man we were we played so great during during the whole season uh, first. Round playoff, we beat Unicaja 3 0. 3 0, yeah. Second round semifinal, we beat Barcelona 3 0. Yeah. And we went into the 
into the final, we were 15 up half time. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, the the momentum changes with the with the on on a finger snap, you know, and yeah. something happened. We weren't uh, at, uh, right before the end of regulation. We were uh, one down with two free throws, and uh, your your friend Santi Abad uh, make one. <laughs> this another one. We went to overtime. And Chichi Cray was at the, one of his well-known exhibitions. Right. And they beat us. Then we, we won game two. And game three and game four, you probably back that especially, are not going to win a game three and game four playoff final in Maresa. Yeah. Like the, let's say that the environment was quite hot, even, even weather-wise. I mean, even temperature-wise. It was so warm, so humid. And they were... Immediately up by 15 both games, but they were, you know, getting back, getting back. Luis Casimiro was coach there. Chichi Creo, then Derek Aston, Brian Salier, um, you know, good, good Spanish play, Vasquez, uh, Peñar. I mean, they were they had a good team, but but of course, after winning the regular season and the first two rounds, the expectation was to to win the league. Then, fortunately, in the following year we won the uh, the King Cup. The King Cup in the, in the yeah, and, and we play Euroleague for the first year in the in the team history, the long Euroleague tradition for yeah. for of course for for that team in Euro. No, nobody nobody can actually realize except for me because I've lived a, a, a game in Mendresa in that court. In I mean I we usually played there because you play, I mean obviously you're playing in June so you got a little bit more of a heat and humidity. When I played there, it was always seemed to be like January, February, when it was the coldest place in the world. <laughs> it was yeah, just, yeah, it, I get it, it. It, it, It's such a difficult, difficult gym to play in. But how does that, as a coach, how does that make you better? I mean, because you say you, what surprised me the most when I researched it was the 3-0 and the 3-0, like Malaga, Barcelona, because Malaga was a really good team also. It, it wasn't like you skipped through a bad a, a bad team in the first round and then you got Barcelona and you surprised them. Uh, you guys dominated that game. As a coach, what's the learning process in that? Like you said, there's momentum could change in a moment. Like you know, when I'm commentating games, I could see someone dial on a floor down by 15, and you could almost call that moment where you feel the momentum change. Right. And well, so how does a how does a coach get better from that? What do you learn? Um, in the, during the playoffs, playing every basically second day, you always need to find a balance between uh, keeping your, your eyes on the spot, on the game you have at, at hands at that moment, but also in the, the midterm, because you don't want to have your players burn uh, you know, game three when when uh, when probably it's going to be money time or or three, four, and five or whatever. But probably from my personal standpoint, my take was that uh, you got to really give a priority to win that specific game and don't think too much on 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 uh, to what what's going to happen. Two days after, or four days after, or I mean, just if you need to play your guys, uh, and actually I learned it. Also, I re I strengthened my my condition at that point in the in the in the NBA and during the NBA playoffs. And you might see now they play with seven players, eight players. Right. Play will play forty two minutes. So when you get there, you don't have to do it too early, because if you do it too early, you will definitely end up having right, exactly. your best player burn at some point. But when you reach the finals. That that's the time to put uh, all 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 the, the the you know the the meat in the in the you know in the in the in the what you pan or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, Just yeah, yeah. cook cook the best the best play you can you can cook or whatever you have at hand. It's it's funny because you know when when you began coaching and when I when I was playing, it was. It was the preseason determined the seven or eight guys that played throughout the season, and yeah. now now the preseason and the season are pretty much 
the, the entire season's almost like a preseason for the playoffs and the final four. Yeah, yeah. especially in national leagues. Like national yeah, exactly. leagues. In EuroLeague, not that much. EuroLeague is going to start from game one, really, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you are not one of those top four, five, six teams who can really think uh, like, like you said before. So, so you go, you you make the typical move that I made. Also, you know, you go to Basconia. You you're successful in Basconia. You have a great great two season in Basconia. You win the Kings Cup. You win whatever. And of course, who else comes knocking on your door but Real Madrid, right? That's yeah. that's us, that's usually how they do it. That's how I got there. You know, I beat up Real Madrid a couple of times as a player in Victoria. We knocked them out of the playoffs. I'm like, hey, let's sign this guy. Is that now? Is that for you the I mean, Basconia, with all due respect, I played there for three years, and I love, I love everything about the city, about the team, about the club, and, and I really didn't want to leave and come to Madrid, but everybody ends up falling for that into that trap, you know? And, but for as a coach, is that like now the – that's a pinnacle, I mean, in, here in, in Europe. Uh, it is. It is probably, but uh, with uh, uh, trying to have a flashback – I was very happy, very happy in Victoria, very happy with the team, very happy with the organization. Um, so I was honestly not remote, even remotely thinking to leave. Then this this offer came up and uh, it was like, uh, okay, I am Italian, I'm, I moved to Spain. That was my first year. So I didn't even know how many years I would I would, uh, I would spend in Spain. So back then, the odds were that I could stay there for a few years, but probably go back to Italy or, or whatever else. So I felt like, okay, this is probably an experience. It is, it is worth to do because maybe I will not, I, not, I will not be able. I will not be able to, to do it anymore. Right. So let's try it. Let's do it and, and see what happens. Uh, and, and actually, it it it, uh, it was worse because uh, it's quite it's quite different the situation, the, the atmosphere, the team, the club, uh, the, the fans, the perception all over the world about about the team and the club are quite unique. So I I, I did it, and and uh, uh, I cannot say that I regret it at all because I had great years. In Vitoria, and and uh, you know, professional coach is always moving from one place to another one. But uh, but honestly, I felt that like it was was a much tougher decision to say in another world. A long story short, than than you you, you might you might see it from outside. Mm-hmm. It, it, you you kind of came in. Well, it's funny how we were sitting here talking, and 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 I'm. I'm putting together the pieces of how we just missed each other in, in Bologna and also here <laughs> because you came right after I left. Right, right. And chasing you or you're chasing me. <laughs> yeah, one or the other. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play for you because I would have probably won another title somewhere along the line. But but it, that was, it was a difficult time in, in Madrid because, you know, when, at my, the end of my time here was, was a strange time. The club seemed to be going in a different direction. And then from the, from the time from you left, you, you won the Spanish league title and you beat Barcelona in like a fifth game playoff. And, and uh, from the time you left, it, they never seemed to like really focus as much on basketball as they have in the last decade, so to speak. Was, was, did you feel that while you were there? Did, did you feel like they weren't really focusing enough on, on basketball itself? Well, it's out of question that uh, that let's say top management of the of the club was uh, soccer oriented. Right, uh, that of course. Is, that, yes. That's and I probably might say that even if the interest and the love, uh, passion for for basketball grew a lot during during this this uh, last 10, 12 years, uh, of course, it's still like uh, Real Madrid club the football. That this right. is our question. But at the same time, uh, when I got in, I felt that uh, there was a will from within, from actually from uh, uh, the 
the, the, the president, the son of the president, to, to try to do something different, something better to compete against Barcelona. Real Madrid didn't have won a league, didn't, 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 didn't win the league for five uh, straight years, right before. Yeah. So the guy win Euroleague, it was huge, but the, the, you know, the t- typical uh, rivalry between Real Madrid and Barcelona was was actually in a in a tough spot because Barcelona. Yeah, coach. Yeah, yeah, coach I know. I was I was part I was part of I I won one of them, but I was part of the couple of the losses too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that feeling was like uh, okay, let's let's try, but without making any crazy step. So there were like little little adjustment. Actually, we were able to to build a, a good team, which was not great, but became very competitive after we acquire uh, Sasha Georgievic, who was mm. uh, cut from, from Portland uh, in around November. So that was a quite important uh, step forward. Um, and and uh, it's true that the, the biggest jump forward happened when uh, Florentino Perez started to, to, to love basketball and to right. feel that there could be could be a, a back in time where, where Real Madrid was was really admired and 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 uh, ended and, and seen as a top club in the world or in both both sports that could be could have been the case. So he got passion people around him like you know the the, the actual uh, actual managers were were really supporting him this and then of course the the investment and the effort they did in the last 10 12 years has been uh, amazing, but of course, well rewarded by by lot of lot of titles, lot of championships. Right. You you I mean you you actually got to do the you coached the first ever Euro League game that went under FIBA, which is the Olympiacos Real Madrid game. Right. That's a, right. Yeah, that was a against that, Coach Ioannidis back uh, then. Ioannidis. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I missed him. I, I missed him by one year when I went to Greece. I've heard a lot of good things about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was was a nice game. Yeah. Then, then you went five five years in Malaga, which now, of course, is your pretty much your home base. I know you have a I think you have a place down in Marbella or something with your family. You live with Blanca. We'll talk about her as as this goes on, also. But in in Malaga, for me, those five years had to be for you almost the most gratifying because you did kind of what I wanted to do. My idea in Basconia, where you did it in Basconia also was, you know, take these teams that aren't supposed to win championships and, and help them win championships. And then what you did in Malaga between winning the the Kings cup, the Copa del Rey, a Spanish league. And you just got, you got Unicaja Malaga. I don't know if they were Unicaja at the time. I don't know what the name was, but you actually got to a final four in the Euro league too. Now, I was, my three teams in Spain were Malaga, Victoria, and Madrid, like you, because the, the fans are crazy. I mean, that must have been an incredible five years for you uh, to be in that, that ambiance of, of winning and, and giving a community and a club everything that they've always asked for, you know, always, yeah. always wanted. Yeah, right. I'll probably get there at the right time. Um, Boja Malkovic had done a, a wonderful job before leaving. Um, I mean, he set the ground to to have someone else to step in and to make you know the ultimate uh, you know quality quality jump. And uh, I get there. I, I didn't get there. I was hoping to go there during the summer. After after I left Real Madrid, it didn't work. But after a few weeks of the of the into the season, they called me up. I remember there was in New, I was in New Jersey uh, following the, the Nets training camp back then. So I came back. I had I had my my wedding coming up in uh, November twenty. So it was kind of the last thing in that specific moment I was thinking of. Is go back immediately and to coaching, but uh, but uh, and the team was last was was uh, at the bottom, at the very bottom spot, uh, very bottom or second from the bottom. So I I found a kind of a very 
uh, I mean, disappointed, nervous, uh, confused situation where people were supposed to have uh, done their best uh, effort to build up a winning team, and they they were you know, catching up themselves at the bottom of uh, of the ranking. So it was quite tough at the beginning. It didn't happen in a, again in a, in a in a snap, but uh, uh, step by step we we got better and we end up get making the playoffs and and ending up in the in the Euroleague winning a, another legendary game five in Valencia. Uh, we, we were getting blown by 20, game one, game three. We were barely winning in Malaga, like sweating overtime or two points. And then we went there. <laughs> I did a crazy, we played 40 minutes zone. Now this is a, a, a subject which is, which is in a, has been in, in a, quite uh, actual, right? In the last days here in Europe, and we played 40 minutes zone. And they 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 had a number they were team with Rigo, Do, Abio, Roberto, yeah. Tomashevich. I mean, unbelievable team. But they got, got nervous because they, and we were 14 down at the beginning of the of the second half. And I was like wondering, what did they do? Wait, wait, right? wait, 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 wait! But you went zone from the start of the game, or were you start went when you game. were 14 down? From the start of the game to the end of the game. And you start <laughs> and you when you're 14 down, you still stuck with the zone. I was, I think I, we were 11 down or 12 down. We went to 14 early in the, in the, in the second half. I said, what can he do now? Should I? Because I was <laughs> feeling that that could probably end up paying. But the, the, the time for, for getting the reward was not coming. So I was quite starting to get a little bit, I would say, doubtful about. Right. Yeah, about, of course. Yeah, of course. So but I said, listen, let's take a couple of more actions. They may, they miss a couple. We made a couple of buckets, and they start they 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 start to panic. They start to yeah. like feel the pressure of having to win a game five at home, and then we end up winning by fifteen in in a, basically in ten minutes. Was so <laughs> one of these crazy memories, which I actually came came up to my mind in these days, like when we had this nice uh, you know interchange with Mike Mike James after. The 40 minutes box and one with Alba Berlin, and and yeah. we had three minutes box and one against Maccabi in the last game. So it was uh, well, you know, sometimes things happen because people uh, react not in the, the the best way. I mean, when you do things, sometimes you are hoping for the opponent not to not not because of the of the let's say uh, value itself of the decision yeah. you make because of how the opponent will take it. And we'll be able to to face it and to react to it. You know, w one of my favorite questions for coaches is, is I, I mean, of course, Malaga decided to invest some more money and 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 get a good team. But what what's the better accomplishment? Getting a good team, getting a team with a big budget. And I know it's. I'm not going to ask you what's easier and what's harder because I kind of know that answer, but. What's the bigger accomplishment? Getting a, a big team with a big budget where you have a bunch of personalities and winning with them or taking a team like Malaga and kind of putting those pieces together and like and playing with a smaller budget and 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 winning and, and becoming a winning team. As a coach, what's like what do you cuz a lot of people would say, "Oh, well the bigger budget obviously is 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 the is the the bigger thing cuz you may win more, but it's a lot harder to deal with those personalities." Than Definitely. it is, form a, a you know a smaller team. Well, that was a, that's exactly what I was saying before about the national team. I'm not talking about budget, we're talking about talent. I would say. Yeah. Well, definitely per would be personalities. Personality, personality. <laughs> definitely, and you know about this, right? <laughs> yeah. I have some some good common friends who can tell me stories about oh, personality. Oh yeah. Definitely. Not, so, not that we could not not that we could talk about those here. <laughs> not is that not in a in a, in, a, in a coaches in a coaches clinics or or yeah. coaches uh, session. So listen, you for sure you will be more rewarded when you have a lower budget team and you will bring it to to success. But honestly, 
I can tell you that it's probably is more difficult the other the other the other way, mm. the other option because uh, handle the pressure, which is not only and probably not not uh, at all your own pressure, but the pressure is on the player, and the pressure which is on the play, about the player sometimes will make them become a little more um, selfish, a little more. Um, tense, a little more um, caring for you know their own performance, even to because they feel the need to correspond to the team investment and to and to pay pay the, right. the manager and back for what they. So that's from from the handling point of view, it's way more difficult situation. When you are in you know an overachiever, when you when you start from the bottom and, and get up. The, the, the way is is like when you play golf, right? If you are in a putting green, it's way easier. It's way easier to putt uphill than down here. Right. Down here, you, if you go too strong, you will end up outside the green. So uphill, you can you feel like okay, we are everything was what we can get. It's it's good because we are we are we are going uphill, right? Probably probably it's a little, little bit the same. I don't know if the comparison is no, no, makes no. sense, but. Uh, I, I love, I, I don't know when you have time to play golf, but if you do, you, you, you I mean, it's a beautiful place in Marbella barely. to play golf. Barely, but, barely. But, but also when you put, when you go uphill and you put the ball by the hole, you have to come back down also. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. That's why you, you better leave it a little short. Little, you have two pass, two pass, play safe. Then you put a second one in. That's it. How, how, before I get into the, the national team and everything, as a as your philosophy as a coach, because I mean all coaches have different philosophy. I've talked to so many different coaches over the years on this and the crossover. You know, I, and Tavi Pasquale one time told me about how like you know some coaches never want to be. Uh, you know, I always I, in my mind it's like if you're an assistant coach, you want to be a you want to be a head coach. But he's like he told me he's like well some people just want to be assistant coaches all uh, all their life, which kind of like opened up my eyes to different things, but. To me, my question to you is: You walk into you've walked into so many different teams. Now coming up is Kimki, Milano, Basconi again. You, you've you've gone through all these teams. When a coach changes a team from one team to another, it, it, I mean, obviously you have to install your philosophies and and you, and your way of thinking. But does that change based on the personnel? Does that change based on the, on the players? Is it more important for you to adapt to the players or for the players adapt to you? Well, it's uh, not easy to answer in a, in, a few, in a few seconds. I would say that there are a few principles, in my view, which are not negotiable. And this is not my philosophy. This is, I think, how the game should be played the right way. Mm -hmm. How nowadays the competition requires the game to be played. Like you got to really be available to play along with other teammates mm -hmm. to share the ball because nowadays defense will be able to shut uh, selfish, uh, even if extremely gifted player down much easier than before. Right. Uh, so first of all, you gotta you gotta feel the will to play along with with together with your teammates. So share the ball. And second one, you gotta share a will to play defense. Then of course, I cannot say that I can demand the same level of defensive efficiency from every player the same the same way because this would be stupid. I, exactly the same as I cannot ask for the same offensive efficiency for everyone. The same, it's not, not possible. But I want to feel people who really try, who really uh, find a way to contribute, who are interested into game plans, who are interested into understanding the, the, the coverages, the, the, the philosophy, what we want to do with it. So those two principles, I would say, are not negotiable. I mean, I, I would, I could barely coach a player who are not who are not really um, into this, committed mm -hmm. into this. 
Then all the rest, you can have more or less flexibility according to the uh, the room you have to pick a player because sometimes you can you can have some some you know wider rooms. Another time you gotta uh, just get get the players whom you find and, and, and the organization where you go you go coaching and and uh, try to make the best of it, right? So that everything else can be quite flexible. And I am not. I don't want to be. I try few of several years ago to to keep my ego under control in terms of uh, I don't need to see in every single possession of the game reflected my uh, taste, my ideal of basketball. Otherwise, I will get mad. I will, I will, uh, you know, stop playing. No, that, that's no, I mean, where I am, I want to be stubborn and I want to be not flexible. It is about those two principles. Everybody else, I would say, it's quite negotiable. What, what's the what's the difference now that you you've answered that question, and I think in a really good way because I mean you have your your non-negotiable aspects of your personality and your and your mentality, and then everything else is kind of like you just kind of you kind of deal with it. But what's the difference? And I want to use these two teams because most people have seen these two teams. What's the difference between coaching? You know, your Spanish national team of 2012 and a 2022, for example. I, I, because, I mean, obviously we're talking about, you know, I, I mean, you, you had Rudy Fernandez, who, who was this year was a valuable, valuable lead. His leadership was, was I mean, I, for me, he was the MVP of the tournament because of what he did. I always call it intangibles that, that, that Rudy brings to a game. But dealing with Mark, with, with with Powell, with with Felipe, with everybody else, and now this year dealing with a bunch of young kids that, like you say, and are they're probably much more dedicated. I mean, they're all everybody's dedicated to the product and the end result, but these guys, these young guys, even want it more. So there's a, a whole different way of, of dealing with those two teams. How'd you handle the the difference? Well, um, actually, 2012 was my fourth fourth year mm -hmm. in the national team and, uh, and uh, the Olympics, I had already decided to, to you know, step out uh, and to, to, you know, because the four years coaching national team and, and uh, club team is quite a tough, um, you know, stint. So I had already decided to move out. Um, but still, we were feeling that uh, our generation was that the say the golden generation was at its best, uh, and that was a blessing because we had many different uh, offensive options mm -hmm. uh, on, at, on, on one hand, but at the same time was kind of uh, making it making it a little bit more complicated because. You have only four, 40 minutes for each position. You have five players on the floor. You have one, yeah. one uh, play call for any possession. If we call a play for one player, hard to play to call it from another for another player. So ev the, the common ground was the commitment. Everybody was really all in. Everybody was on board. Everybody wanted to win. Everybody wanted to really uh, make whatever it was in their hands to, to make the team, the, the team win. At the same time, the habits of, of the different group of players were different. So in the first group, there were players who were basically the go-to guy in, in, in every situation of a different team, club team they were playing. And they were having 30 players, or in the NBA, even 37, 38 minutes per game. Right. Uh, and in, in, in the national team, in that, that national team, I had to put players who were this kind of players into a role player spot and given them seven minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and still make trying to make them feel how important was that contribution. Right. So that was that was extremely demanding from, from this point of view. With this team last summer, um, they were not really uh, coming from uh, uh, being the star of their team experience. They were right. basically um, good 
complementary players, letting alone a couple of cases. There were players who were never, who were barely playing, like Juan Chandili had a quite poor playing time season before. Other players were coming off the bench in their club teams. And it, so, like Rudy was, was uh, as you said, an unbelievable example of leadership. But in Real Madrid, I, I, I don't even know if you read the 15 minutes per game. And so we, we had to do the opposite. So make this guy believe that they could step up and become the go-to guys in the, in the even if we could, could uh, look absurd, right, from, from the outside. Like how if the guys don't have that, that position in their teams, how can they have it in the national team? But at the end of the day, it worked it were because everybody was really putting their best from the defensive end. And offensively, things follow. So people started to, to believe that they could score, that they could, uh, you know, in, in, in a, within a team system where people were passing the ball to each other and playing together, um, shot, easy shots were, were happening every now and then. So people were feeling like, okay, I can score. So next time I will pass it. Next time the ball will get back to me and I will score again. So it was a nice chemistry, a nice uh, overall atmosphere of, of team togetherness. So, so you're saying other than a law degree, you have a psychology degree also. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if you don't study, and if you don't study not only books, philosophy, uh, psychology, but also day by day, I... I I prefer to read a, uh, a psychology book than, than a novel, honestly, right. because, because I think that this is a huge part of my, and even sometimes I get to go against some of the psychology principle, because sometimes when you speak to psychologists, um, they forget that this is not an individual sport. So the concept that you get to make the best of each player is very right. theoretical. Here, you get the make the best of that team potential because it's impossible that every play play up to his best potential because otherwise there would be games with the 600 minutes positions where you have three play three players playing 40 minutes having 25 shots per i mean this this is impossible you gotta the, the the chemistry goes by sometimes do, doing something which is not uh, say from the psychological point of psychological point of view, exactly correct. But it's sort of like, listen, this is what it is. Take it or leave it. I had to make the decision. I know that you you might not like it, but um, you will like it probably next time, hopefully. And if not, you got to be ready to like it the third time, because this is what this is what they pay me to make decisions. You know, your, your answer to that last question, and I love, the reason why I love to do these interviews, because especially with coaches, because I learn, I always learn something, you know, from, from listening and paying attention to what's going on. And, and the fact that you were able to take a team with Pau Gasol, Juan Carlos Navarro, and make these guys believe that seven minutes was enough for them to be part of the team. And then they go to people who didn't even think that they, they would ever play seven minutes in a national team and convince them the, the, the total opposite, that you're worth these seven minutes and get out there. And, and you saw your team build confidence during the summer. I was watching the games. I was actually in Greece during the, the last, last couple of rounds. And, and you saw your team going, do you remember a point over the summer where you, where you, where you just looked at your team like, yeah, I think we could really win this. No, the, that night before the finals. The, the, the night, night before the finals. <laughs> Honestly, it was like I wouldn't even I, I couldn't even say. Well, at the beginning during preseason, as as you were saying, where we, at some point we were losing by twenty against Greece after the first quarter in Athens, the very first exhibition game. Right. I was feeling like, oh my god, <laughs> this, this is going to be, be a long a, summer. A long summer, <laughs> long summer. <laughs> And then against Lithuania, we were again down by 20 in the first quarter. We played a friendly game there. We we're like, wow. But, uh, you know, sometimes the competitiveness, the, the chemistry, the, let's say, uh, collective, uh, let's say, pieces get in place when the competition starts. When you get into the real, hey, 
we got to we got to really you know give our best and that's always the hope i have with the with the spanish national team because i always feel that we will be able to multiply on the floor the say the the uh some of the of the individual uh talents put put together like like uh, separated you know we the, the, there will there will be factors there which will make our team collectively better than what it might look uh, if you just consider the the the, the amount of the individual talent uh, one after the other one after the one and four separate. Yeah, it's when when I look at you and I look at all your the stuff that I've that I've researched here and everything I've seen. I, I think you, you probably think the same way most of us think. You know, we all, as athletes or coaches, we all have to have some sort of bravado about us and, and think that we're the best. But we also have to know that, you know, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time many times when you know, to play at Real Madrid. You went to coach for four years in, 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 in North America, in Canada, which was right across the border from Toronto, right across the border from where I was, I was born and raised in Rochester. And uh, the first year you get there, you win an NBA title. Come on, you, there, there's some luck involved, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Man, I mean, without luck, I think we'd, even, even... We'd be nowhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Even, even to avoid, uh, you know, two bad things to happen, that's luck. Because many right. bad things happen to many people who can deserve the same, the same success as you do. So I keep it very clear in my, apart from jokes, I keep it very clear and very, very present in my mind. I got to be very grateful with my, people say, uh, talk about the hard work, the many hours, the passion, all the stuff, which I also feel, I don't want to be a false modest. I also always feel that I really commit myself to, 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 you know, to my job and to my sport, but there are many people who do. And I, I think that, uh, you got to keep in your mind that uh, uh, you got to be grateful. You got to be grateful uh, to players, to, to owners and managers, to the people you have around your staffs. Um, you, you, Sometimes you are the, the visible face of a success, but uh, never ever forget whole, also those many people, fans, for example, or, yeah. or those many people who are behind and keep being humble, keep being, keep being grateful. Don't think that you are more than, than, than what you are because, because that's probably the first, the first step towards uh, failure. Just, just enjoy what you have and don't, don't be too uh, greedy or hungry. I got to do this, what you have left, what you want to will have. Listen, let's have a good practice tomorrow morning. And, 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 and get out of the practice with a smile and with a satisfaction of having done a good job. What, what do you want to do most? And then you will have a game and, and, and fight and, and compete and do your best to prepare and to compete and to play the game. And then more things will happen. War will not end after a loss. Or, or yeah. war will not make you a god after a win. I mean, war is going to be more or less the same after a win or after a loss. So let's just don't take yourself to that, that's I, that's something I keep very very clear in my my soul in my mind. And and that's difficult for a lot of a lot of athletes to to you know to go by that philosophy that you know I, I, one of my favorite comments was always you're only as good as your last game, you know and every day is a new day and and you know, as I've gone through life I, I've learned to kind of like like keep this even keel where like I go back to the sixty three point game I scored. I, I remember the 63-point game, but what I remember more is the, the following Sunday we had a game against Barcelona. I scored 19, but I was f I was four for 17 from the field. Yeah. Okay, you know, and that that's like the rude awakening. You know, like it was, you know, the 63-point game didn't give me anything at that point except for a victory that night. Well, but, you turned down you turned down a great offer. That was up to you, man. Man, I'm telling you, I believe me. I coach coach Blatt when I talked to, to David Blatt years ago. He told me the same thing that I, you know, that I almost signed with him. I'm like, man, I would have loved to play for you guys. <laughs> Not that I had bad coaches, you know, playing with Shelko Bradovic was quite the experience to say the least. And uh, and Shelko taught me a lot personally, also off the floor, also, which is, you know, I'm eternally grateful to him. But tell me about the, 
Yeah, I don't want to get too much into your Toronto time because it, it, it's it, it's four years of your life, so it's pretty important. But what what for you was first the the, the reason to go? I mean, most coaches go because they want to learn, they want to expand their horizons, like you maybe did when you came to Basconia. But also, I, I want to know what you saw, what you see about what the difference is between an NBA player and a European player, not talent wise, but I'm talking about more like the, the treating, the, the, the way to get along, the way to, you know, cause there's so much more in the NBA that's outside of basketball that influences a player's life. Um, and what's the difference between the two places, especially for a coach, your assistant. All right. Answer that question first. Then I'll ask you the other one. Okay. Well, first of all, the reason why I moved there was basically because I, I wanted to get rid of this podcast of agents, media, managers, fans, pressure. I just wanted to commit myself to the game. I just wanted to say, listen, I am, I am tired of this. I need to stay just diving into the game 100% without any, any complications, any, any extra stuff, any, any, you know what I mean? Just pure basketball. Just go to practice study the game, analyze the game without having to commit any, any extra time to anything which is not exactly, specifically the game itself. That was my main reason. I learned a lot and, uh, and uh, definitely I learned a lot from uh, two point of views. First of all, to uh, was a kind of a, of a humility uh, experience. A humbling experience being in a league, in a player's league. You can feel that that's a player league, especially if you have superstar, if you have superstar in your team. And you got to find a way, it's, it's challenging because you got to find a way to be respected. I remember that during the first month, I think Kawhi didn't even say hi, or maybe it'd say hi <laughs> with, with the half a mouth. During the playoff, he was coming by before every game, he wanted me to sit down with him 10 minutes and go through every aspect of, of, of the coming, upcoming game. So to tell you the, the evolution of the relationship. Right. But at the beginning, it was like, wow. Kai Lowry now is, is one of my, I would say, best buddies there. But at the beginning, it was like, wow, this, this guy is, let's say, weird to say the least in terms of how he wants to show his status into the mm -hmm. team. Early. And, and he's a lovely guy, and I love him, and I got in touch basically on a, on a, you know, at least monthly. So you got to feel that there is, there is it, it is not like they can do whatever they, they want. And it is not like I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. It is fine on a daily basis, find a way to, to feel, to understand what, what is doable, what is what makes sense? What can be accepted? Which kind of award you got to find to make this kind of people understand why you are proposing them that? Um, find the right the right timing and having the feeling also very last second to take something off if if you feel that situation has changed. You got to be much much more sensitive to to the players' atmosphere, to the team atmosphere. You're coming from a back to back. You are coming from five and seven days. You are, you, it's not the same like you have three days between game and game and you can put stuff in. Or, you know, it, it's like be, be, be extremely uh, attentive to, to uh, the, the, the feeling, the team feeling, the player's feeling. You might, you might uh, actually feel, right? Um, then it is to coach without overloading. And that, that's the main principle in the NBA. This is not like we never practice. It's not my too many games we cannot practice. No, this is not. Of course, you got to be able to coach using different tools and you've, using different loads. So you cannot kill, kill them, uh, you know, running up and down during two hours between a game and a game. You got to find a way to work, for example, without body contact, but at the same time working on coverages, working on drills, working on uh, three on all, four on all, five on all, to find a way to coach without overloading. And this is extremely helpful for me now 
in in the in the this kind of a season with the team uh, with with Virtus because you you know that uh, you have a very tough season. It's true that you have a quite quite uh, deep roster, especially in some positions in our case, not in others. But at the same time, at the end of the day, the players who will make the difference will be you know three, four, five. So those guys cannot be overloaded. We had to take care of them. We had to. We cannot get in that uh, red flag area where the, the injury risk is high. So coming from that experience for me as a coach is make makes my job easier because I don't feel that my ego or my desire to coach or my feeling that if you don't if I don't make um, you know as kicking practices or, or, or crazy heavy practices. I'm not really coaching. That's off. I mean, I, I learn how one to, to, to still coach without, uh, you know, putting players at, at injury risk like uh, like they, they do really well in the NBA. Yeah, man. I You know, I, I always, when I hear coaches talk about that and I hear that like Selko Obradovic is coaching, you know, is, is practicing one time a day, it makes me feel like I wish I was born now and I was playing in this age. <laughs> Well, man, you had way less games than, than your 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 bodies here now. Yeah, we have way, we have way less games, coach. Well, we practice a lot more than anybody else does True. now, man. And, and practices True. were practices games were easy for us. G- True. Games games to me were like a day off. You know, it, it was okay. like man, no double practices, no weights in the morning, sprints and running, and then you know all that other stuff. But it's a different time, without a doubt. Right. Yeah. But but I, I like that 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 philosophy is carried over in a way to to the to the Euro League because now you, after four years of NBA, you've kind of you took yourself away from the responsibility, and you stepped back, became an assistant coach. You said you kind of divulged yourself into basketball, you learned more, and then you decided to come back and get back into it again in Europe. How, yeah. I mean, I- yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, tell me. I, 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 that's pretty much the question. I mean, why? How? Uh, and there you are. The time was weird because I just, I had just signed my three new three years extension, and I had a meeting with Masai Ujiri, which I consider a brilliant mentor. Even, even if uh, we didn't stay, you know, too many years together, it was an unbelievable high level leader. Uh, that he was kind of uh, expressing me uh, consideration for my future, you know, after this this thing. But at the same time, I was feeling the desire to to go back uh, to a head coach job to also to to implement what I learned. So after three years of of, of really working hard and and having the great joy of winning a, a NBA ring and and Playing playoff, being in an unbelievable organization. I mean, NBA, it is worth to, to, to be there for a few years. Definitely. I would recommend it to anyone. Right. But at the same time, you feel like, okay, now it's time to, to put on place and in and, and action what you learn. And this this interesting offer came up. And I I remember that that the night which I which was before the day I decided. It was the day to make my final decision. It was the only sleeping night I missed. Right. Probably in my last 20 years. You know, even before the game or after the game, I couldn't close my eyes during, during the whole night. And then after making the decision, I felt like, man, that was a no-brainer. Yeah. Now that you <laughs> made the decision, you're like, wow, you are so excited and, you know, do let's see if this is going to work, what, what you can, you know, like, like a different, but, but honestly, it was tough to come back. The, the reason, main reason was the, the feeling that uh, I, I needed to, to go back to a full, full-time head coach position, both with the national team and with the, and with the new team in Virtus here. The, uh, one of the, the constants that I see in your resume, so to speak, with uh, I mean, your resume, because you're still young. I mean, really, you're still young yeah. to, to everything that you've done. And uh, one of the things that, that I've noticed throughout all this is your ability to take teams that aren't 
maybe let's not say not supposed to win. I mean, you've had teams like you know the the Spanish national team, with, you know, with Gasol and and Juan Carlos and everybody, but you also had teams like Malaga, Basconia, that really love to win, want to win, but aren't really expected to win. And you did the same thing here in Bologna. You come into Bologna in the first year, you you in 2022, uh, you won the Euro Cup. The accomplishments, I mean, you, you have some men, I'm going to read them in a minute, but is that a big one because you came back from from NBA and you said, you know, this is what I want to do. And in the first year you win the Euro Cup and, then you, and, he, and now you're in the Euro League and, and you're right where you want to be almost, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... It's like uh, a new readjusting, and 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 uh, now this way back. Before when I went there, I was bringing some ideas, and they want they they wanted me to to bring on um, to bring over some some European concepts or part of my my personal ideas or in general what what we mainly do in Europe. Now this time was go back to Europe and see what it could work from there, along with the the, the you know the main base of my of my knowledge and my philosophy which which is of course deeply european so um it's it's uh and this year is, is a even uh of course more difficult challenge because we are new in euroleague most of our players never play you they can be better or worse i don't get into that i my players are always the, the best in the world but but honestly many of them were in their uh first first Euroleague year ever and some of them were not but they are you know approaching the the last part of their career exactly so it was kind of a kind of a challenging situation where try to 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 put everything together and to to make everybody understand that first of all we have to be patient because this is a very demanding competition and teams and players even maybe with less talent or as skills, but who have been in the competition for more years, they they know probably at the beginning better than us what it takes to succeed, especially the the idea that every possession, not every every game, every possession counts. <laughs> that, that, that's, what, that's my favorite saying on TV. I'm like, forget every game. This is every possession you're in Definitely. these games. I, I can't agree more. Uh, but at the same time, to, to be to be ambitious and to and to to say, hey, let's stretch this the more we can. Let's see where where we can we can get. Let's where 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 this can can bring us. The, you, you, nothing nothing is against to be a really good team in the first year. So uh, it's a kind of a, a double double direction. Right? At the same time have the right patience in terms of understanding and, and uh, making the right steps in the right timing. At the same time, don't don't slow down. If you have a chance to win a game more, let's win a game more and, and keep working, keep growing, keep keep uh, making our young players grow, keep our keep our squeeze the best juice out of our veterans until the very mm -hmm. end and and try to, to put together a decent competitive uh, unit. I want to get in a little bit of personal stuff, and then we'll do the test, and I'll let you go. I, I I have to say I pride myself on my work. I pride myself on being, like, in tune with everything, making sure I know everything before I sit down with somebody, especially with a coach, because you guys are way much more intelligent than I am. I'm still, I'm just an ex-player. And, and last night when I was at the, the Veterans Dinner, I was talking to Geronimo, Gerardo. And I was like, yeah, you know, I said, I got, you know, I got a, the interview tomorrow with Sergio. And he's like, oh, he's like, and he says, uh, he's, he's got it. He said, he just came out with a new book. And I'm like, he what? He said, he just can't. He's like, and he looked at me. He's like, you're going to interview him tomorrow and you don't know about his new book? <laughs> and, I, and So I'm admitting to you that even though I did all the most research I could, I missed the fact that you just came out with a new book. Is it is yeah. it only in Spanish? Is Spanish Italian? Is it like easily? Because he told me he's like you should have read it if you're going to interview him. I'm like, I man, I don't have that much time in my life. <laughs> and it's not going to become a Pulitzer Prize. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> so no, it was just uh, an idea which many people were keeping 
Stephen Ambrosimi. And then my last year in the NBA was a guy who was a former student of my dad back in time who proposed me to, you know, was making all the researches to help my memory to dig into things and stories and everything. And, uh, and he was sending me, you know, bullets. And I was, I was uh, actually uh, recording some voice, voice uh, messages, whatever. It was writing it in text. I was correcting them. And then the chapter was, was done. And we did it in Italian one year ago. And then uh, this, uh, you know, they, they got it in Spain and uh, they saw it, they liked it. They said, okay, let's translate it. We had them one more chapter, actually last year, last season, with the, the you know, Supercopa and the Euro Cup or whatever. And then and, and it came out in, in Spanish last uh, fall, in October, I think. Well, we're still in fall. And, and that's it. I mean, it's just, uh, just uh, uh, was fun. It was not too heavy because that was the way I did it. So it was not like I would never sit down and, and write on a, a book by myself, absolutely. I was good, <laughs> but now I promise not to not to do anything <laughs> anymore because that was. I mean, my my writing experience is is done with it. <laughs> well, I, I I'm expecting a signed copy sometime soon. That's a, 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 a little dedication with a signed copy. I will. I will. A, a, a lot of people a lot of people don't know this, but they might not know this. But our wives are obviously good friends. They've known each other for years. And I've known Blanca forever, you know, for, and uh, if, for anybody who doesn't know this, who's, who's listening or watching the podcast, Blanca was one of the best basketball player, female basketball players I've ever seen. So not only, not only did you coach basketball your whole life, you married into basketball also, even though she retired quite early. But, and, and how, how, how much easier does that make it for you as a coach, to be married to somebody who understands the rigors of, of being a professional basketball player, and of course, hello, of course, hello to Blanca. I haven't I haven't seen I her in a couple of years. Same and... same wise to Eva. So uh, at the at the during many years of my career was extremely helpful, and uh, because I I was never you not know, like you guys. I was never a superstar to say to say it in a in a in a no, nice no. way. I mean I mean I never. I could never think and feel like a, like a superstar thinks and feel. And this is, this is absolutely, you, you, I mean, it's impossible, right? You have a different, different way of more of a team player, more of a, of a coach, like a, like a teacher. And, and that helped me a lot to understand, even to understand what I didn't like of this right. kind of players, right? And uh, honestly, it was extremely, extremely helpful because I didn't have at all that that vision, that part of of, uh, of a vision of a top talented player who are so gifted that uh, can absorb a lot of usage, a lot of possessions, um, can play defense only when it's really, really the the given day with where when when you need to all that kind of uh, of uh, uh, features, which, by the way, you know, I don't want to insist, you know, quite well. So, for good or for bad. But yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and then, you know, at some point, she became kind of a, of a, basketball is my enemy, because he's taking my husband <laughs> off me. There was so many hours. That, that, so was, many that was my, ne that was my next question. I mean, so you, you're segueing it for me. Yeah, yeah. But uh, now we found a kind of a balance where where she can travel when I am out on a road trip or or we have my son is playing in NCAA so she can go visit him or my daughter is studying in Madrid so she can go visit him or we should go to Marbella to her family, whatever. So, I mean, she, we, are, we are finding a good, a good way to, to, to make it work. And uh, I think we found a good balance right now. But there were there was time where where it was honestly tough. And honestly, I can I can understand why so many of my colleagues uh, get divorced at some point. And this is sad, but but this is what happened because this this profession 
this this job is really, as you said, if you don't have someone who really loves, understands this, and even like that, it's, yeah. something <laughs> at some point will 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 get get you in trouble, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not going to be possible because it's it's really a twenty four seven. I would say three hundred and sixty five, and especially for someone like me who has two jobs, this is this is yeah. still the the big domestic issue. I mean, okay, they are they have their thing, but uh, then they have two months in summer. Then you know, and I not, but for a couple of more years it's gonna be like this, and then then we'll see what. What the future will bring us? Yeah, well, you tell like, I, I don't I don't watch you guys suffer, but I don't see her suffer very often in their Instagram all over, like you know, in Madrid yeah. with her friends. <laughs> I told you she found the balance. She found yeah, the balance. <laughs> she She's found figured the balance. It out. <laughs> Definitely. The the last thing for me, well, two last things. Family. You you talked about your son who, who's playing basketball now, Alexandro. Uh, What's that like for you? I mean, he's he's been in the U.S. playing at a at a, a Baptist university in Arkansas, I believe, right? Yep. And, yep. And is that? I mean, do you do you do you watch video of him? Do you do you critique him? Do you? I mean, well, I watch I watch games. Right. But uh, I'm very very cautious in in making mm -hmm. observations. First of all. Because uh, I might I might not uh, control every single part of what they do, like you know exactly. their philosophy, their coach. Actually, his head coach is Dennis Nutt. I don't know oh if you remember. Oh my God! Yeah, him. I remember Dennis Nutt. He played for Real Madrid with George yeah. Carr back in time, and he yeah. was play was teammate of of Isma Santos at the same time. Right. So it was a funny story right there. Yeah, Dennis, Dennis, issue, but played, is, Dennis played in. Did he play in BYU? I think uh, Brigham Young was. It? I think so. I think yeah. so. And then he, I think well, so. he was an incredible shooter. Great shooter. Yeah. Yeah, great shooter. So um, he he is a very good coach, and, and but at the same time, is he he is an NCAA coach. So with right. different personnel, different yeah. goal, different. So I want to be very respectful, respectful of my of my colleague. At the same time, I don't want to be. The typical, because I have seen so many of those ter terrible uh, example of of oh. that coaches, former players, uh, dead yeah. like man. I when I see them, I feel ashamed <laughs> for them. You know, I don't want to be, of course, not not in the in the in the stands, right? But not even at home, not even phone calls. If he asked me, now he got the maturity level where he's asking me and I will give him my opinion right. but I try to give him my opinion as a coach not as a dad yeah. because as a dad I would be oh, for sure I'm biased and 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 I, I would probably be a little bit more biased in terms of come on you can do more you can why you did that yeah. why you did that not, not, so not, I, push, I try not to, pushing him yeah I try to stay away from it and say listen this is my opinion I don't know if it's what you guys do what I according to what I I understood now that is your coach philosophy, and it's it's it get a maturity point. I'm very proud because he made his his way into into an NCAA team with uh, having been becoming a starter, becoming 22, 23 minutes per game player. With uh, you know he's Perfect. he's doing his role and and then without any help, without any push, without any specific uh, uh, reason to. to be there instead of other guys. So I'm next year. He'll probably come back from from there. He will he will get a degree. We'll come back and we'll see. We'll see where where his basketball career will will a professional basketball career will start from. All right, coach. It's test time, and we'll get you out of here so you can go enjoy your family for Christmas uh, and the holidays. All right. This is a Euroleague test. Every time I do this, I always forget who who's up there. But but actually, uh, I Marshall Glickman. The new CEO, his his case just came out today. I think he's he tied with three other people for a hundred points. They're gonna send it to me now in a minute. But it, uh, it was Kevin. It was Dante. Dante Exum got a hundred points just recently. Oh, Marshall didn't do the test. My bad. Dante Exum did the had the hundred points, and I had a couple last year. But 
This is this year. Five questions. Each question is worth the my first question is worth 10 points. Second one is 20. Third, 30. Fourth, 40. Fifth, 50. Obviously, they get more and more difficult. All right, here we go. For 10 points, who is last year's Final Four MVP? Misich. There you go. You want to see, look at it. See how easy it is? Let's take it easy in the beginning. That's 10 points for you. Question number two, worth 20 points. How many games can a team play in this EuroLeague season? 41. There you go. Very good. That was, that was, that was pretty quick. That's 30 quick points. Let me see. Next one. Who won the first finals MVP in the modern EuroLeague era? Wow. You were there. I mean, you were there. That was you. You, you coached the first game of the season, so first game, not the last one, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was year Panathinaikos and Macau were not in because they were in the in the so-called Super League. So I'm getting I'm getting messages that I can tell you who won it. Who not not who won the MVP? Okay, give me tell me. Team won it. Tell me tell me who won. It. Virtus Bologna. <laughs> so, Manu Ginobili. There you go. I don't know, man. Hey, this is coming. This is coming from Pablo from your league. So I gave you the hand. I usually oh, don't give you, hints. Thank you. Thank you for your help. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right. Next question. Worth forty points. So you're up to sixty. Who are the three coaches with the most games won in Euroleague history? Well, I would say Jelko. One. Ettore. That's two. You're missing one. Third one, I think it might be. Duda? No. No. Pasquale. Oh, Chavi. Oh, happy for you. He made it. 241. Oh, All right, now here's, here's an important question because it's worth it's too young yeah for that. Tell him it's too young yeah for that. No, tell me about it. That's and unfair. When, That's unfair. <laughs> when I when I did this crossover with him, I like Tommy. I'm like I'm reading all these things, and you're younger than me. I think. Absolutely, it's, it's yeah. great. But he's a great coach. I love doing yeah. an interview with him. Absolutely, he's a great guy to talk to. Absolutely. So you still have a chance to take the lead uh, with 110 points if you answer this next question. Question number five: Which country? has had more different teams playing in EuroLeague history since the start of the modern era. Can be tricky, right? Or not? I'm just going to tell you. Can it be tricky or not? I, I wouldn't have gotten it. I wouldn't have you gotten, wouldn't the gotten No, I wouldn't have gotten the answer. That's, that's, that's already a help because and, and I just got a message from, from Pablo a year ago. He said, no hints on this one. <laughs> we said, we already gave you, we already gave you the 30 points for free. So no, come on for free. That's, that's a 50, <laughs> 50. Uh, so this point cannot be Spain, because it would be easy. Honestly, I mean, it can be, it can be several, but, but, uh, I don't dare to. Because Italy had a few different, Russia had a few, Greece had a few. Should I do that? Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is among those. <laughs> I, I can't give any hints. Okay, okay. So let's say. This is for the all time lead. This is for the most points ever in the yearly history, in the yearly test exam. So I can't give any hints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Greece? Man, you should have went with the country that you were born in, my man. Well, really? That, 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 was, that, was, that was my first thought. First thought, first thought said, because they were different, yeah. There were 12, 12 teams altogether. 
And I, yeah. I, I asked them before when they sent me the question, I'm like, does he have to name all 12 teams? That's going to be impossible. <laughs> well, I might. I might. And, We're the football on you. Hey, hey, I'll tell you what. We'll give you some. We'll give you some extra points if you name all 12. Well, let's stop. But two Bologna, Milan, Treviso, Siena. Do I get to 12? With the modern Euroleague, you mean, right? Modern Euroleague, yeah. Wow. But. Uh, No, I can't. I mean, it's it's like it can be really, really Let crazy. Me see. I'll, I'll go over real quick. Uh, uh, Armani Milan, Mantupasi, Benetton Treviso, Fortitudo Bologna, Logomatica Roma, Virtus Bologna, Scavellini. Uh, oh Can- wait, wait, wait! Is it the modern Euroleague? That was I, 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 I appeal because they asked for modern Scavellini. <laughs> I was there. There was not modern. Hopefully, I wish it was modern Euroleague because Uh-oh, there was 1991. 90. So, we might have an issue there because I got Cantu also. Cantu, of course, but that's not modern Euroleague. I appeal. No, no. I appeal. Present yeah, my yeah. appeal to, to your to your bosses. You take it. You take it up with the Euroleague after this. Yeah, but I asked. Specifically asking about is it modern Euroleague? You have said yes. So I, have, I have right of a of a reserve question. At some point, yeah, his, the next. It the says next. since the start of the modern era. Well, the modern era was when Naismith invented best. I know. So, all so, right. Okay. Let's... Thank you. Thank you for including my final four in the modern modern era, even if it was <laughs> thirty one years ago. Thank you. I get it. That's. A, that that's what I say always about my sixty three point game. They they say well, it doesn't really count in the yearly. I'm like, why not? I said if 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 Zelko Orbanovic has nine titles, then Mike's sixty three point count my sixty point of game counts. Count. Of course they do. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, wait a minute. Let me see what Pablo said to me real real quick. Two thousand five. Uh, Two thousand five. They played. Oh, Scavolini. Scavolini. Oh, that, that's another one. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's another, another one. one. That's ah, another see, one. They're, they're, already, they're already checking your appeal, my man. So appeal is rejected, okay, yeah. <laughs> now, you, now we'll figure it all out. Okay. Coach, okay. Uh, number one is thank you so much again for taking the time. I really appreciate you doing this. It's been it, it's been five years of, like, learning so much from, from talking to different people, and I've learned, obviously, a lot from you. I wish you and the family, obviously, happy holidays. You told me before the show, this is between us, no one's going to hear it, that you, you, did, you didn't mind taking a couple hours to spend with me today to get away from the house for a little while. <laughs> I'll get you in trouble one way or the I'll other. I'll show you. I don't know if you see the there face of the I first, the first the call. Call right now. <laughs> no, I'm not going to wait. I'll be, you'll be right home. Okay. Well, Coach, it's been, honest, it's been a real pleasure. Next time you're in Madrid, hook, look me up and uh, love to get down, sit down and, and chat with you a little bit more. Looking forward to it. Take Thank care. Thank you so much for your time Merry and Christmas. your honesty. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. you Happy and Bye-bye.